All right, so we're going to start. Um, so the topic of today's presentation is going to be on uh, recent drug abuse trends. Uh, those of you that are more junior might not remember or might not know, but a couple years ago, one of our seniors, Maggie, uh, who's now doing ICU, did a similar topic looking at kind of the broad categories of emerging drugs of abuse. If you have not seen that presentation, I strongly recommend that you have a look at it. It's really, really good foundation, covers most of the big families. What I'm going to be doing today is mostly just look at what's changed in the past couple of years, what's been um, uh, kind of new or what's become more prominent since that presentation. Uh, so there's a few families that I will not be covering at all, the tryptamines, the piperazines. Um, so if you want a more of a background, I strongly recommend that you give, uh, give that presentation a, a try. It's quite good. Um, so our objectives for today, we're going to be looking at um, trends in cannabis and cannabis-derived product use. Uh, we're going to have a review of the recent fentanyl epidemic that's been hitting Canada and, and Ottawa. Um, we'll look at recent trends in uh, new psychoactive substances, NPS, which is a broad family that includes synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic cathinones, phenethylamines, um, as well as tryptamines and piperazines, which we'll not be covering. Uh, and we'll look at uh, the local trends and monitoring methods for emerging drugs of abuse. So we'll start with a drug that we all know pretty well, so cannabis, um, which is quite frequently used. It's the most frequently used drug in, in Ottawa. Um, it contains two mainly psychoactive substances, THC and CBD. Both of those are cannabinoids, and cannabinoids is not a chemical family, which took me a little while to really wrap my head around. It's whatever happens to interact with cannabinoid receptors. There can be any kind of molecule, any kind of structure, as long as it interacts with that, inter that receptor, it's considered a cannabinoid. Um, so there's two different types of cannabinoid receptors in the body. CB1 is largely found in the CNS as well as the spinal cord, but it's also found in the rest of the body, uh, in the heart, in the fat tissues, in the muscles, in the liver, etc. cetera. Um, and it largely acts as a, a modulator for the release of neurotransmitters, both glutamatergic and GABAergic neurotransmitters. CB2 is largely found in the periphery to a lesser extent in the brain microglia, thought to act as an immunomodulator. Now, THC acts as a partial agonist at both of these sites, and CBD acts as an antagonist at both of these sites. So in terms of the presentations, what you see with these two molecules is actually quite different. People that are, are taking large doses of THC can very well present with agitation, hallucinations, psychosis, uh, whereas people that are taking CBD, it actually has an, an antipsychotic effect, and it's been investigated as an antipsychotic in the past. So what does that really mean clinically? Well, when I think of people that use pot on a regular basis, I usually think of hippies. You know, you're basically grandma's garden variety pot, which back in the day used to make people like really mellow. Um, and at the time, it contained about 2 to 4% THC and about an equal amount of CBD. And the overall effect that you'd usually get were people that were kind of chilled out, giggled a lot, had the munchies. Um, <laughs> Nowadays, things are a little bit different, however. Uh, pot has been uh, grown in a different way and crossbred in a different way to make it more potent uh, and to derive new brands like the skunk weed. Uh, and these are very, very high in THC, so 12 to 18% of THC and minimal to sometimes no CBD. So what you're seeing nowadays and what they've been reporting is an increase in uh, psychosis and hallucinations and agitation presentation with people that use these types of drugs. Um, and I've actually known people that used to use pot back in like high school um, on a somewhat regular basis that recently, after having you know, teenage kids and all that stuff, decided to try to smoke a joint and became floridly psychotic and vomiting and hallucinating for about a half an hour. Um, this very well might be why, unless there was something else in there, this might actually be the, the reason for that different presentation. Pot's not the same anymore. Um, I decided to cut out a section on edible marijuana products. It's become a big thing in the states that have legalized marijuana. It's not very big in Ottawa, but it has been seen in other Canadian cities. If you guys want to know more about it, I can either go through it at the end uh, or feel free to ask any questions. At any point in this presentation, I want to make this fairly interactive. If you have any questions, just ask, okay? One of the big trends that's been coming out and is quite prominent in Ottawa is dabbing. Um, so you've probably all received the email a little bit earlier this year about Shatter. Uh, so this is what it is. It's the broad family of butane hash oils. Um, and the end product contains about 80% THC. 
Um, the consistency of the end product can vary quite a bit depending on the method. So this particular one would usually be referred to, refer to as butter, B-U-D-D-E-R, also earwax and honeycomb, uh, depending on how dry they are. And this is usually uh, the less pure product, the less good product. People are trying to make this in their homes, in their basement, in their bathrooms, which is not a good idea. The slightly higher quality product is called shatter. It's more dry and brittle. And to make this, um, it's a process that's called blasting. So people put a bunch of cannabis trimmings in a, either a steel or a glass tube, uh, and then they put some butane in there, which is slightly less flammable than uh, propane and slightly less volatile than propane. So still a, not really something that you'd want to play around in your basement with. But anyways, so they swish that around and then pour out the butane and the lipophilic molecules that have been drawn, discard the, uh, the, the trimmings, and then put this in a bucket, put it on hot water to evaporate the solvent and get that dried product at the end. So this is the product that they get. Um, as you can imagine, that process is not without risk. And there have been some reports of, of people injuring themselves, of blast injuries, of burns, because butane is very flammable. Um, we haven't really seen a whole lot of burns due to this in Ottawa, but very often people won't report that this is what happened. They might say it's the barbecue or something like that. So you have to ask very pointedly because they will not tell you that this is what they were doing. And this has been found in Ottawa both at user level, so people are making this in their basements, and also at trafficking level. So shatter is being trafficked in the region. And the way people use this um, is kind of dangerous. So now that they've like soaked their basement with butane fumes, um, they take this metal nail, which you can see at the bottom, which is supposed to be made out of titanium, but it probably almost never is made out of titanium. I'm sure it's made of junk metal and you know lead solder and, and steel and all that stuff. Then you take a propane torch and you heat that nail up. I see a problem with that, but anyways. So you heat that nail up and it heats it up to like 400 degrees Celsius. Once it's hot enough, they use a little wand to grab a, a dab, which is why it's called dabbing of the, the product, put it on the hot nail, and then grab the oil rig or the glass thing, put it on top and inhale the fumes to get high. Produces quite a, quite a high. Uh, people become quite euphoric. And again, because of the high THC, it's not rare to have psychosis. Um, but as most of us would probably put together, you heat something to 400 degrees Celsius, then you inhale the fumes. There's a very real risk of causing some airway burns with this process. The other thing is that you're heating this metal thing, which is almost never actual titanium, um, to very, very high temperatures. So you're probably creating some rust that you're aspirating, that you're breathing in, that can settle in the lower airways, um, as well as you know, heavy metal, solder, lead solder, all that kind of stuff. There's pretty much no research on the chronic effects of the use of this yet. We're probably going to be seeing it in the near future. It's kind of just emerging. So I'm guessing over the next five years, we're going to start to see all sorts of nasty things that can be caused by this practice. The other thing that the butane hash oil family overall is being used as is in e-cigarettes. And that's really becoming a huge trend. People are using a lot of different drugs in e-cigarettes. They just dissolve it in solvent, put it in there, and, and use that instead of nicotine. And in fact, one of the products that's been on the market that's apparently huge in Ottawa that I'd never heard of before um, is called Juju Joints, uh, which is really fun to say. Uh, and it's this company. <laughs> This company from the States that's created this thing, and what they claim is that they use high-pressure liquid CO2 to extract the compounds, the THC and the CBD, from the, can the, the cannabis plant, and then purify it and sell it in these, like, not single-use, but um, basically not refillable little sticks that look kind of like fancy makeup from Smashbox or something like that, so they're all fashionable. This is all over the place. Apparently, young people are using this a lot, and they make three different types. So one is just THC, one is a mix of THC and CBD, and one is just CBD. They claim that it's at least 40% of THC in there. Now, my problem with this thing is that it's so, it, it is possible, it definitely is possible to do that, to go from the plant that has like 200 plus chemicals in it and extract just the THC and CBD, but that's a really expensive process. So I would bet that this is more likely synthetics than anything else. I have nothing to support that claim. Um, I've spoken to the Ottawa Police Service. They're the ones that are telling me kind of what's been seen, what's been in Ottawa, what's been more prominent. They're also not sure really what's in there, um, but they're seeing a whole lot of it. And the other family that I want to chat about in terms of cannabinoids are the synthetic cannabinoids. And I did not put these structures up there because I'm going to be giving you a test or anything. I just wanted to make a point that when I was saying that any molecule that acts with a cannabinoid receptor is called a cannabinoid, this is what I mean. So it doesn't take a chemist to look at these and say, wow, these are really, really different molecules. 
Um, and for people that are producing drugs, this is actually making things a lot easier for them because they're starting with a whole bunch of different skeletons that could potentially be active. And by using processes like CombiChem, you can start with one skeleton, make hundreds of different molecules, basically give that to rats, see whatever makes the rats crazy, and just make that product and sell it. Now you're starting with a whole bunch of different skeletons. So with these molecules, it's very, very, very easy to skirt around the legislation. And what they've seen is in places like Japan, they've actually followed the trends on the street um, for a few years before introducing legislation and after. With the synthetic cannabinoids, within six months of banning a substance, it's just completely replaced by another one because it's just so easy to do it. And the reason why these are so bad, um, most of them are not studied, as you can imagine, because they're, they're so different uh, that we just can't keep up with how many are being produced. Uh, one of the better studied ones is, oh, is GWH018. So it, this gives us a little bit of an insight as to how these things act and why they're so bad. Um, so the THC metabolites that I'm gonna show are all circled in red. The JWH ones are all uh, with, the, with the orange square. And I just wanna show like the initial compound for both of those is active at both CB1 and CB2. We've already mentioned uh, THC is a partial agonist. GWH and most other synthetic cannabinoids are actually full agonists at both of those sites. Then once they get metabolized, uh, there's three different metabolites for these particular molecules. For a different one, it's gonna be completely different. Um, and of those three metabolites for THC, only one of them is actually active at CB1 only and with reduced activity. The other ones are not active and the further products of, um, of metabolism are not active either. With the GWH, however, all of them are active at both sites. In this particular case, they're all either partial or full agonists as well. With a different molecule, again, they can be antagonists, they can be partial agonists, we don't really know. And these are basically receptors that are modulating neurotransmitter release, uh, including stimulating and uh, GABAergic, so glutamatergic and GABAergic. So that means that with this kind of cocktail that's kind of all over the place, you don't know if you're gonna get an excitatory kind of um, picture or uh, you know, a depression kind of picture, depending on which metabolite happens to be more prominent at that particular time. Um, and to further go on with that, so the, uh, the THC metabolite after conjugation, no longer active, gets renally excreted. The GWH one is now an antagonist at CB1. So again, it changed, the picture changes depending which molecule you're taking and when you've taken it, how much of it you've taken. Synthetic cannabinoids are generally sold in these brightly colored packets. They used to be mostly spice and K2, um, and they're usually labeled not for human consumption or, or labeled as potpourri just to try to circumvent again the law um, because they're, they're not regulated. Um, some of them are more gutsy and they'll actually say they're a legal high. The problem with that is that people actually for some reason think that because it's legal that it's safe. Uh, so they do think that this is a safe alternative to marijuana, which it most definitely isn't. It just hasn't been banned yet. But people, for some reason, have a little bit of trouble understanding that. Um, and the way they make it is that they take a whole bunch of different herbs, random herbs, uh, dry them up, and then they dissolve the compound in solvent and soak the herbs with it, let it dry, and sell it in packets. So with that process, as you can imagine, uh, if you take a bunch of the herbs in the middle of the pack and a bunch of the herbs on the side of the pack, the content of the active psychoactive molecule is gonna be very different. So you can smoke one pack, get a little bit of a high, smoke another pack and completely overdose. And it's not in any way, shape or form quality controlled or predictable. The other thing that they're doing is adding a whole bunch of other stuff in there to make the active molecule harder to detect, to try to delay um, legislation of that molecule. So they'll add vitamin E, they'll add a whole bunch of other stuff in there just to make it more complicated, as well as other psychoactive compounds. So they might be adding cathinones, whatever else they happen to have on hand. And uh, the other thing that's, become, that's been coming up in the past couple of years is the liquid version of these. So the, the K2 liquid that you're seeing in the bottom corner, people are putting that again in e-cigarettes or just adding it to energy drinks and drinking that straight up. And the reason why people are using this largely is to try to evade detection. So there are people that are generally are looking for a cannabis type of high, but for whatever reason can't do it. So US military, people that have to take drug testing for their jobs, people that are on parole, want to get a cannabis high, know that they're gonna fail their drug test, so they use this because it's not detected in most drug screens. Most of the NPS, uh, all of like the cathinones, the cannabinoids, they're not detected in our regular blood, blood screens. You have to send them to specialty labs to really be able to find them. And most job places don't really do that. Most um, police stations looking for patients on parole don't really do that either. 
And this has been found in Ottawa. It's largely in the user level, so not a large volume of distribution that they've actually been able to find yet, uh, but people are buying this off the internet and using it recreationally in the region, for sure. So in terms of clinical presentation for the cannabinoids, um, it is quite varied, again, because of the various actions of agonism, antagonism, the metabolites, and all that stuff. It's a pretty muddled picture. Um, but it, they do have prominent cardiac effects, which can present as either tachycardia um, hypertension or a bradycardia and hypotension, depending on the batch. Um, there's actually been case reports of STEMIs in teenagers that are otherwise completely healthy after using these drugs, and several cases of sudden deaths that are otherwise unexplained. Um, there's a lot of CNS activity, which is why people are using these, uh, and they range from uh, people that have CNS depression all the way to agitated delirium, a handful of cases of seizures also that have been reported. One thing that I find interesting is that it's pretty common for people to present with an anticholinergic, anticholinergic toxidrome. And I tend to have Disney characters from my Toxidrome stuff. You're going to get to meet a few of them. The Mad Hatter is my anticholinergic guy because he's kind of red and googly eyes and kind of crazy. Uh, so people will present with a dry, flushed, red skin, uh, dry mouth, uh, and, and blown pupils. Uh, and it's the only NPS that presents as an anticholinergic Toxidrome. Not all the time, but it's pretty common. The other one that's quite common is uh, hyperemesis. People vomit a lot when they're taking this medication, when they're taking these drugs. Um, a few rare cases of liver failure. Uh, rhabdo is fairly common, as well as acute kidney injury. And the acute kidney injury is not always due to rhabdo. There have been several cases reported of isolated kidney injury without any uh, elevation in CK. I'm guessing one of the metabolites or one of the drugs is a direct nephrotoxin. We just don't know which one. Um, and again, these things tend to come out in outbreaks. So for example, one of the synthetic cannabinoids, Pinaca in Colorado, came out and they had an outbreak where it was causing um, psychosis and excited delirium. And then a few months later, there's another outbreak of another synthetic cannabinoid that's causing bradycardia and CNS depression and hypotension. So it, it tends to come in, um, in groups, if you will. In terms of treatments, um, if, like everything in talks, it's kind of largely supportive. It needs to be aggressive supported treatment. Um, Benzos and Haldol are the first lines. Uh, both have been used safely. I've not seen any uh, reports of Haldol causing harm, even though these are known to have significant cardiac effect, and for some people that could be a concern. I've not seen any, uh, any reports of any adverse events because of the Haldol use. Um, there's a few interesting cases reported of use of intralipid. The case series, it's only four cases, and these were patients that had significant cardiac morbidity, so they were bradycardic in the 30s, hypotensive, really unwell, and successfully treated with intralipid. Case series of four, it's not exactly great evidence, but I guess if your patient's really not doing well, it might be something to consider while chatting with ICU and the, uh, and the poison control center. The other big thing for these has been withdrawal. A lot of people use these on a regular basis, and when they try, they develop tolerance, and when they try to stop taking it, they have significant withdrawal symptoms with uh, nightmare, severe anxiety, uh, tachycardia, diaphoresis, um, and we don't really know how to treat it. We don't really have any evidence. Uh, there's been an increased demand on detox centers for these types of molecules. We don't really have anything to guide us. Um, however, there's this one, again, it's only 47 patients, the one study that's done in New Zealand and Auckland. In New Zealand, they have a lot of problems with the NPS. For some reason, New Zealand and Northern Europe, these are very, very prominent there. And one of their detox centers, at both inpatient and community, reports that for these 47 patients, they managed the symptoms successfully with Seroquel and Diazepam. So something to consider. I'm not sure that I'd be comfortable just prescribing that on my own without discussing with anybody. Um, but again, it's kind of part of your tools, part of your arsenal, and something that could be uh, up for discussion. So in summary for the cannabinoids, the new cannabis products have increased THC, decreased CBD, and tend to cause more psychosis than they used to. Um, dabbing is a fairly dangerous uh, procedure, so dangerous to make the product, and uh, likely a danger with uh, inhalation. We don't know the chronic effects from, from this practice. Synthetic cannabinoids are terrible drugs, um, much, much, much worse than the initial uh, THC and POC use. Um, they can cause severe psychosis, severe cardiac effects, sudden death, uh, so nasty, nasty drug. 
The next one I want to talk about is fentanyl. Um, so we've probably all seen in the news uh, the, the fentanyl epidemic that's been hitting Canada. There's really been quite a lot of fentanyl deaths uh, across Canada, and, and the region has definitely not been spared. And when I think of fentanyl use, I used to think of the fentanyl tea. So that used to be a thing. I live around Somerset Village. We used to have posters everywhere a few years ago about the dangers of fentanyl tea, which is why they take up. Um, and that used to be kind of a small marginalized population, at least from, from what I was able to tell. And then since 2012, so the Oxycontins were discontinued, made into Oxyneos, which can't be uh, snorted or crushed as easily. And since then, heroin and fentanyl have just soared uh, and have become a very, very, very significant issues. Um, so these are the kinds of headlines that we've been seeing, uh, especially this year after having a lot of warnings. They tend to be pretty dramatic, but the reality is that this is a huge issue. Um, these are the most conservative numbers that I found. Uh, the suspected deaths are actually considerably higher. They suspected, I think, 894 deaths in Ontario last year. Only 120 were confirmed, um, but this is probably just a, a very, very, very conservative approximation. And the fentanyl problem is largely twofold. So on the one hand, you have the patches, uh, which are the ones that we're probably a little bit more familiar with. So people divert their patches, they sell them off, um, they, they steal them. There's actually 40 patches that were stolen from a downtown Toronto pharmacy just this summer. Um, and they also sell their cast-offs which I didn't really realize people did. Um, a little bit innocent sometimes, but like when you peel it off and you've used it for a couple of days, there's still 60 to 90% of the drug, and people will just chew that or, or make it into tea, even if it's been on like a very hairy person, apparently. Um, <laughs> there's, like <laughs> there's even been reports of people peeling them off bodies in funeral centers. So the level of desperation to use these is beyond anything that many of us can really imagine. The other big problem with fentanyl has been the powders. And those can be either just fentanyl or fentanyl derivatives. And these are becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Initially noticed in Rhode Island in 2007, it was acetyl fentanyl that was made in a cartel in Mexico by like this Breaking Bad type of chemist called The Brain. That got dismantled, but now people have really caught on to the idea you can make these fentanyl powders, it's more potent than fentanyl, and you can smuggle them very easily because something the size of a makeup case can sell for tons of money and make you a whole bunch of doses. So it's very easy to smuggle through the airport. And we are importing so much of this stuff in Canada that we're apparently selling our leftovers to the northern states. So we're exporting them to the states because we just have so much on our hands. It's probably beyond what we can imagine. Yeah? Yeah, I was going to get to that, the Patch for Patch program. It's been started in the region as well, and that's a brilliant initiative. Um, we're going to get to one of the issues about those, though. Um, so the, and the fentanyl powder, one of the big problems that's being laced into other things. So people, it's really, really cheap, like really easily available, really cheap for drug dealers. People sometimes seek out the fentanyl, but sometimes they don't even know that that's what they're taking. So it's much cheaper than heroin, much cheaper than cocaine. So dealers are just mixing it into a bunch of stuff. Um, the green pills that you're seeing, the greenies or oxies or oxy-80s, have been seized in massive numbers across Canada. Um, they're being sold as oxycodone, and people don't realize it, and they contain fentanyl, which is considerably more potent. And of course, these are not quality controlled, so people will take one pill, it has just a little bit of fentanyl, not realize it, they're not really getting high, take a second pill and overdose. Um, sometimes they're just kind of caffeine and fentanyl as well, uh, sometimes again mixed with, uh, with cocaine and inhaled. Um, some of the fentanyl analogs, the big one is the one at the top, the acetyl fentanyl. So the, the powders that are being imported are often these types of fentanyl analogs. Uh, and this is actually a picture that was taken from a drug lab in Montreal in 2013 that was making these, that was dismantled. They found about three kilograms of acetyl fentanyl. Um, the other two are much less common, but I wanted to mention especially the carfentanil because it's exceedingly potent, about 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And it's used for large animal sedation, so it is kind of easily available. It's not really a drug that users would choose to use because it's a very like rapid onset and very short duration, and they know that it's extremely deadly. It lasts about 10 minutes when you have a high with this, uh, and, and it's so potent that it can very easily kill you. Um, I actually went on drug websites to see like whether people are actually using this and stuff, and they're saying they, they're not really choosing to, um, but it could very well be mixed into other stuff by dealers that just happen to have this on hand. 
Um, Butyrafentanyl hasn't been as much of an issue in Canada as far as I've been able to tell, but it has been seen in Norway and some of the uh, European countries. Um, we only have a handful of case reports about this one, so we don't have a whole lot of good information about it. So in terms of harm reduction for fentanyl, at this point I don't think we can really control the problem. It's become so huge that we just need to try to minimize the damage that it's doing. Uh, and as Dr. Vianco mentioned, Patch for Patch program has been started. It's kind of started in Northern Ontario, now it's trickled down to Ottawa, where um, you have to bring in your used patches in order to refill your prescription of fentanyl, which is a great idea, except now people are making fake patches to hand in. Uh, and there's not really a good way to detect those. So they're kind of trying to skirt it. And from what I understood, they're trying to find ways to detect those fake patches, but I don't think there's been a really efficient way to do that at this point. Um, changing your prescribing practices, there's been a lot of uh, you know, stuff coming from the CMA, the CMAJ, to try to change how we're prescribing opiates. Um, in the emergency department, we don't tend to prescribe fentanyl patches a whole lot, uh, but certainly whenever I do a sedation now, at the end, I just squirt out the fentanyl and the propofol and the garbage. I don't just leave the syringe. Um, some little things that we can do to, to be careful. The other big one that I really wanted to mention is the self-administered Narcan, because it is not yet in Ottawa, and I think this is extremely, extremely important. It is present in Montreal, and it's basically user level that will have this Narcan on them for themselves and for their buddies if they notice that they're overdosing. And you can imagine if like, people are using, even if they're using with buddies, uh, by the time somebody notices their friend is overdosing, then they try to wake them up, then they try to see, oh, they're not waking up, oh, we need to get some help, oh, call the ambulance. Like several minutes have gone by, the ambulance shows up, several more minutes have gone by, then they have to patch for Narcan, because they can't just give Narcan. Um, so you have the time to die a number of times in that interval. Um, really important to just I think start this program of having user administered Narcan. It's a fairly benign drug. There are some theoretical risk for it, but I think the benefits in the case of this really, really large epidemic that we're having very much outweigh the theoretical risks. So in summary for fentanyl, it is very, very common across Canada and including in Ottawa. Um, patches are being diverted and stolen and cast-offs are being sold. Um, Fentanyl is being trafficked as well as its analogs and coming in, in in very large amounts into Canada, being laced into a whole bunch of other drugs. So users may very well not know that they've taken fentanyl or that that's what they are taking. The next family that I wanted to talk about are the cathinones. And I don't know if any of you used to watch Breaking Bad, but I thought that was a really creative wrapping for the bath salts. Um, it's really pretty, and if that person could put their creativity to good use, that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> so. So overall, uh, cathinones initially came from the plant cut, which is chewed daily in Africa and, uh, and, um, and so northern Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Basically, their version of coffee. They just kind of get together and chew cut. And it's fairly benign as long as it's used reasonably. Um, but in the early 2010s, people have isolated the active molecule and started to uh, synthesize it and synthesize analogs. Um, initially became known as bath salts because they were being kind of sold as little rocks and sold as bath salts to circumvent the law. And the initial popularity was very much tapered when there were reports of people, this, this one guy eating another man's face off, as you might remember, which he, turns out he wasn't on bath salts, but it really kind of put a bad name on bath salts. Um, and unfortunately, that did not last. These are increasing again. Last year in Europe, they were the fastest growing family of NPS, and they're becoming on par with the synthetic cannabinoids in terms of prevalence. And this is very, very, very much present in Ottawa. Uh, MDPV is pretty much everywhere. It's being sold as MDMA. Most of the MDMA, as you all know on the street, is not MDMA. It is not ecstasy. A whole bunch of it is actually cathinones, um, as well as a whole bunch of other molecules, synthetic cannabinoids, etc. But MDPV, very prominent, uh, very prominently sold as MDMA, and also found in dip cigarettes, which is another thing that I didn't know existed. So people take these cigarettes, they dissolve the drug in some sort of solvent, literally dip the cigarette in it, let it absorb, and then dry it off and sell the cigarettes so that people can just be on the street smoking these cigarettes and they're actually smoking these pretty heavy drugs. Um, whether they know it or not, I'm not sure. Um, and the cathinones uh, largely are, um, release dopamine and inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, norepi, and epinephrine in terms of pharmacology. So what you, I'll, actually, I'll just mention this one cathinone that has made the news, especially in the States, called uh, alpha-PVP. It's been known as gravel or flaca. Hasn't really made its way in Canada yet. I think it's actually just a matter of time, because this really became a thing in the States in the spring and summer, and we usually see things a little bit delayed. So I would not be surprised if we really started to see this in Ottawa in the next uh, 6 to 12 months-ish. 
and you get headlines like this one with, uh, with Flacca. Um, there's been a lot of very dramatic stories coming out of Florida. Uh, so overall, you probably all know that cathinones tend to uh, produce, in cases of overdose, excited delirium. So people that become extremely agitated, hyperthermic, uh, develop superhuman strength, um, and, and they can very often die very suddenly. It can take like 10 huge heavy police officers to sedate one guy or to just kind of keep them down. So it's a pretty terrible presentation. And Flaca seems to be even worse at producing excited delirium than, than most most of the cathinones. And the thing that's very prominent with this one is the feeling of being chased for reasons that are unknown. So people will, there's a couple of guys that crashed into a police station with huge rocks because they thought people were chasing them. One guy was naked on a roof shooting at stuff because he thought people were chasing them. Um, like a whole bunch of people running naked on the street because they thought dogs were chasing them. Uh, so this feeling of being chased for whatever reason, very, very common. And it produces these dramatic media stories, so obviously makes the news. Um, but it has genuinely become a big problem in Florida and Texas. The really big issue with it is that it's dirt cheap. It's five bucks a vial. So it's now come to be known as $5 insanity. Uh, it's replaced crack cocaine because it's so cheap. And the users, from, from what I've been able to read, understand just how dangerous this is, but they're heavily addicted, and it's the cheapest way to get such a high that they can actually find. Um, so because it's so cheap, again, I'm highly suspicious that this is going to make its way into Canada in, in the somewhat near future. Um, so we've already alluded to this, uh, but the clinical presentation with cathinones tends to be a massive amount of aggression, excited delirium, uh, a lot of paranoia. And again, with the excited delirium type of picture, they will get hyperthermia, uh, rhabdo, uh, metabolic acidosis, sudden deaths, especially if they're being restrained. So physical restraint in a patient that has excited delirium is very, very, very highly associated with sudden death. Um, the other thing that's becoming known as the cathinone phenomenon is um, the risk for mechanical suicide. So in the UK, what they were able to find over the last few years is that for over 40% of the patients that died uh, after using cathinones died of mechanical suicide. Um, and it's much more prevalent than with any other drug to the point where it's becoming known as the cathinone phenomenon. So to treat these, again, they need very, very aggressive chemical sedation. Physical restraint does not work. It just makes them uh, more prone to dying, actually. Um, I know that there's sometimes concerns with using Haldol in patients that are intoxicated, especially if they're already hyperthermic. Um, however, these patients really need to be, as Scott Weingart says, says, like, chemically taken down. Um, the best tools that we have here in Canada, uh, or in Ottawa at this point, seem to be Midaz and Haldol. Um, do bear in mind that these take about 10, 15 minutes. They, they will only be given IM. You can't start an IV on these guys. So they'll have to be given IM, and it takes a good 10, 15 minutes for these drugs to really start acting, which is a really long time when you're a first-line worker and you have this person with excited delirium in front of you trying to kill you and everybody around you. Um, so I think we need to start thinking about what we're going to be using in the future to sedate these people. Um, ketamine has been brought up, droperidol, there's been some nice evidence that's been coming out uh, over, the, over the past year. So I initially was planning on including that in my talk and I ran out of time unfortunately, so I won't be covering it. But I think it's a discussion that we definitely need to start having. The other big thing with these guys, once you've chemically sedated them, is to uh, make sure to cool them down and give them lots of IV fluids. They will usually have rhabdo, need to flush their kidneys, and cooling them down is whatever you can. Ice packs to the groin, ice packs to the armpits. Uh, if you can submerge them, some places actually have submersion tubs. Uh, once they're intubated, they're always protected. That's a very efficient way to cool them down. We don't have that here in Ottawa, but uh, some hospitals do. And again, the big thing for these is to, we want to avoid prolonged physical restraint. Okay. Next family I wanted to talk about are the phenethylamines. And I'm only going to be talking about a couple of compounds. This is a huge family, okay? And it's, it's generally a hallucinogenic kind of family. So that's why I put, chose that picture. Um, so overall, the phenethylamines, it's a very basic kind of chemical structure that's being found for a lot of molecules that are very active in the body. So epinephrine, norepi, dopamine, all have a basic phenethylamine type of skeleton to them. So it's not surprising that a lot of the very common drugs have the same skeleton, right? Uh, MDMA, methamphetamine are, again, phenethylamines at baseline. Um, and many of you might know, uh, a few years ago, there was a book published called PCAL, uh, Phenethylamines I Have Known and Loved, by this chemist that basically made a whole bunch of these and tried them out and explains in the book how to make them and how he felt when he was taking them, um, which I do not recommend doing. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, we're going to be mostly covering the, the new ones that have, that have emerged and that have been a problem in Canada because this is a, an absolutely huge family. Most of them produce hallucinogenic kind of effect. And they might also have serotonin and uh, sympathomimetic kind of um, uh, presentations. And one thing I just kind of wanted to point out is if you take methamphetamine and you add just a little ketone group there, this is no longer methamphetamine. All of a sudden, it's a cathinone. So that might kind of link the two. The cathinones technically are kind of phenethylamines, which is why they're, they're slightly similar in their presentations, although the cathinones to be a little bit more uh, dangerous and a little bit more dramatic. So one of the drugs that I really wanted to cover there are, is the NBOMEs, or NBOMs, or SMILES. Um, this, uh, again, according to our police friends, has been found very much in the region. It's being trafficked as well as uh, used on a user level, so bought on the internet, but also being trafficked on a larger scale. Um, it's a fairly new compound. It was just uh, available in Finland in 2010. And the interesting thing about it is that it's a very, very potent serotonin agonist. In fact, it's the only real known full serotonin receptor agonist. It's initially used in research for that purpose. And it also has a alpha adrenergic receptor agonism. Everybody that's using these, usually, or deliberately using these, knows that when it's taken PO, it's actually fairly weak. Um, so they will usually use it by nasal insufflation or by uh, putting it under the tongue. Um, it's actually so potent that it's the first uh, NPS that's actually able to be put on blotter paper. I don't know if any of you might remember this. Uh, LSD used to actually be sold on little blotters that people would put under their tongues. Um, and this is one of the big problems with this because it's being sold as LSD. Uh, so people are selling these blotters. They're saying it's legal LSD or clean LSD or just plain old LSD. Um, and it, it most definitely is not. So in terms of clinical presentation with these guys, um, a lot of hallucinations. And obviously, Anis in Wonderland is my hallucinations character because she eats mushrooms and like talks to angry flowers. So, um, so a lot of hallucinations, which people find very pleasant. It's also an intactogen, so they feel like they're interacting with their environment and they can you know, smell sounds and stuff. Um, Sympathomimetic because of the alpha adrenergic receptor, which is, I mean, <laughs> Speedy Gonzalez is totally sympathomimetic. Um, so, a lot of hypertension, diaphoresis, hyperthermia. Uh, and the other thing that's obviously very commonly found is um, serotonin syndrome. So, I use Thumper because of the clonus. If you guys have a better character for sympathomimetic, I would love to hear it. Um, <laughs> So again, full serotonin receptor agonist, so it's very, very likely to cause serotonin syndrome, which is not something that you usually see with LSD. Um, and in terms of presentation, these people can often present with seizures as well because of the serotonin syndrome. Because of that, the first line of treatment for these would definitely be benzos. There were people that were theoretically reporting that if you use Haldol, you could increase the risk of seizures. There's not really been any case reports to substantiate that claim uh, that I was able to find. Um, I mean, I'll leave it up to your judgment. I think most of us, if we see something that's suspicious for serotonin syndrome, would be giving benzos anyways uh, as first line. The chronic effects of this are completely unknown. Uh, we don't know if uh, big people develop tolerance. We don't know if they have any withdrawals. It's still a very new compound, so we're still in the, the process of getting to know it and getting to know what it actually does to people. Um, there's been a few fatalities that have been reported that were caused by N-bombs, largely in the context of people dying of, uh, of serotonin syndrome. Um, and this is probably very much underestimated because they only started looking for it recently uh, in, in even the very extended drug screens. It just wasn't part of it, and they haven't really gone back very far to figure things out. Um, a few reports of, uh, of uh, sudden deaths and a few reports of people self-inflicting trauma, jumping off balconies, etc. Not as much as with the cathinones, however. And the big problem with this drug, as I've already mentioned, is people think they're taking LSD. LSD is actually a safer drug than this. Uh, the risks of overdosing are actually lower. Uh, because this one is much more potent. The risk of serotonin syndrome is not really there. In 50 years, I haven't seen a single case report of serotonin syndrome due to LSD. Um, and the risk of suicide uh, is, is much more elevated with this than it is with LSD. So this is not a safer alternative to LSD. It's a much worse version of LSD that is being sold just to circumvent the law. And it is in Ottawa. It is being trafficked. It's probably going to become somewhat prominent. The other one in the, P the phenethylamine family that I wanted to mention is PMMA and PMA. So this stands for paramethoxymethamphetamine and paramethoxyamphetamine. Um, it's a local product, unfortunately, produced in the 1970s in Canadian clandestine labs, found to be really nasty. It was labeled death or doctor death on the street. There were a bunch of deaths in the UK from these Superman pills. Um, so it had a pretty bad rep on the street. 
uh, and it disappeared. And there's been a reemergence. So in the early 2000s in Australia, and um, later on in Israel and Norway. The reason I wanted to bring this one up is because of this paper that came up in CMAJ Open in uh, early 2015. Um, so the authors looked at uh, a time period between June 2011 and April 2012. This is actually the best evidence that we have on uh, mortalities from PMMA. These are all cases that, been, that people that died that were then linked to use of PMMA. They were done based on information from the coroner's office and then extracting data from the charts, but these were not people that were involved directly in the care of the patients. So there is some information that's missing. So for example, we don't know if people knew they were taking PMMA, if they thought they were taking something else. From the other reports that have been out there other than this research, it seems that people usually think they're taking um, uh, MDMA, but PMMA is much more cheap to make, uh, so it's being sold off as MDMA because it gives a somewhat similar high. And what they found in this paper is they looked at 27 deaths, 10 people died on scene, 17 in the hospital. Um, of the people that made it to the hospital, uh, the the toxidromes that were largely present are sympathomimetic and serotonin syndrome predominantly. 16 to 17 had serotonin syndromes. It seems to be a, a pretty uh, common thing. Um, and a lot of them obviously had end organ failure, so 85% had kidney failure. Okay. Um, about 30% had liver failure. Half of them had rhabdo. 15% had MIs. And a lot of people on autopsy had pulmonary edema. Um, a lot of co-ingestants with these. Most of them also had MDMA because it's being used to cut MDMA. Um, and about half of them had cocaine as a co-ingestant. This has not been found to be very uh, predominant in Ottawa, but again, it was found in the, in the prairies and it was found in the West, uh, Western Canada for a little while. Um, we haven't seen it yet. We very well might in the future because, it's, again, it's so cheap. Um, the big problem with it is redosing. So again, it gives a high that's similar to MDMA, and people that might be used to taking those drugs take one dose, uh, and PMMA has, uh, is much more slow onset, but then once it hits, it's much more potent. So people will redose, they, they don't feel anything after half an hour, an hour, they'll take another one, they don't feel anything, they take another one, all of a sudden it hits and people overdose. Um, the interesting presentations for this is there were several case reports of people presenting with hypoglycemia and hyperkalemia. Um, these were not really reported in the, the Canadian studies. This is more from stuff that came from Europe and the States. Uh, but it does seem to be a trend, and I don't really know why people have these, uh, but it seems to be pretty common. And again, the multi-organ dysfunction. So there were several of the new drugs that I wanted to cover, but uh, I'm going to leave them on the back burner just for the interest of time and so that we can have some discussions. Uh, so overall for, for NPS, uh, for cathinones, MDPV is very, very common in Ottawa. Alpha-PVP we will likely be seeing soon. Uh, commonly people present with excited delirium and not uncommonly will commit uh, mechanical suicide. And bombs are pretty common, so um, sold as legal LSD or sometimes mixed into MDMA. And the risk for those is largely serotonin syndrome, so you want to be very aggressive with the benzos. Um, and PMMA, not quite seen in Ottawa yet, uh, but again, it's a pretty deadly drug. Uh, risk of sudden death, multi system organ failure, and uh, serotonin syndrome, along with uh, low blood sugar and hyperkalemia. And this is just to show you how much the NPS have been exploding lately. The best research that we have is really from Europe. So NPS are very common in New Zealand, as I've already mentioned, and in Northern Europe. Um, so a lot of the data that we have actually comes from there. Um, and you can see here, uh, the bottom red line is the synthetic cathinones. So as I was saying earlier, when they came out, they were kind of pretty popular for a couple years. Then there was this really horrible story about the guy chewing on the other guy. Uh, that made them become pretty unpopular. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and now they've just exploded. Um, and they're sometimes being used deliberately. And they've looked in South London uh, in clubbers, about 76 people, 76% uh, of people were deliberately taking mephedrone, um, which seems a little bit crazy to me, but anyways. And, and sometimes just mixed in with other drugs to unsuspecting people. And they've pretty much caught up to the synthetic cannabinoids, which is the green line that's right above it. The other thing that I wanted to point out is how big the yellow section above those two is becoming. The yellows are the others. So people initially, they used to be very much divided, the NPS, into these neat little categories. So you had the tryptamines, you had the piperazines, you had da-da-da. Um, and that's pretty 
much becoming lost now. There's more and more diversity in the structures. There's more and more structures that don't belong anywhere. Um, and those were the ones that I was initially hoping to cover, things like benzoyl fury, synthetic opiates as well that don't really look like opiates but that act on opiate receptors. Um, and so it's becoming much more diverse, much more easy, much more hard to catch. So if you're just randomly fishing for some sort of molecule in the blood of somebody who suddenly died, who shouldn't have died, it really, really is hard to identify these compounds. So in terms of monitoring, um, people have been fairly creative, actually, in uh, trying to follow this up. Because if we wait for proper evidence to be out there and for coroner reports and all that, you've kind of missed the ball. So in, in order to, first off, know what to look for in, in, in these new patients that are dying, um, and, and secondly, to try to stay a little bit ahead of the game, um, people are basically devising new ways of, of doing research. Um, Searches of online stores and web forums is becoming a kind of a, a fairly popular thing. Um, a couple of uh, groups are doing that in Australia and Europe uh, and a couple in Canada as well. So they basically do internet snapshot surveys of these drug forums like Blue Light where people just discuss their drug use. Um, and they also search the dark web, which I didn't even know existed. There's this thing called the dark web where people sell and talk about this stuff. Uh, so they'll do searches of this just to see what's actually out there. There's a few drug checking services kind of on the street level, more or less reliable uh, for, for people to check that their MDMA actually is MDMA. I can tell you it's not MDMA, but anyways. Um, a lot of surveys that are being done, so in the States every year they do surveys of high school students just to see what kind of drugs are people using. Um, the more interesting ones are the ones that are being done in people that uh, use drugs. So the South London Clubbers survey will tell you like how because that's, that's really the population that's, that's going to be using as opposed to these broad surveys. There are some problems with the methodology for these. People are kind of self-nominated, um, but it's, um, it's kind of a good way to start to have information about what to expect that's going to be coming. In Sweden, they've started this, and I couldn't get the logo for the university, unfortunately, this project called Strida at one of the labs, and they're and a patient confidentiality rules are a little bit different over there. So whenever somebody comes into the eMERGE and they have a suspected or confirmed drug overdose, they send blood samples to the Karolinska lab and then they analyze what was in it. So they've been able to detect a whole bunch of new compounds by doing that. And this is done not necessarily with the patient's consent. So I don't think that's really something that we'll be able to do in Canada. Um, but they have been able to follow trends and to detect new things uh, quite early using this method. The other one that's a little less pleasant is wastewater analysis. So they've actually done that in Finland and Oslo where they literally just take sewage and send it to the lab and see what's in it. Um, I, I find it amazing that they actually find stuff because there's so much like signal to noise ratio that I, I don't understand how they actually manage to detect it. I would tend to think it'd be way too dilute, but apparently it's not. And they are seeing um, uh, some of the newer drugs the one that's a little bit maybe more targeted is uh, in, in the UK, in uh, clubbing areas, they're going to uh, analyze the urine of porta potties um, during the summer months. Um, a little bit more concentrated, <laughs> a little bit less noise, I guess, um, but it's kind of a similar idea. Coroner analyses are, are useful to say what's been out there and what's already killing people. It's probably the best kind of solid evidence that we have. But again, by the time we get there, uh, thing, the drugs have become an established problem. The NIDA lab in the States is an interesting um, development. So they've started this, this drug lab that is actually has a license to use illicit drugs. And what they do is they've found a way to have uh, kind of test tube receptors. And they just, the drugs that are found to be out there, they throw them in there with the receptors, see how much they interact with them to determine which ones are at high risk of addiction potential. And that just helps the DEA kind of schedule things. So it's not really good for finding out what's out there, but maybe for determining what really needs to be scheduled and at what level. It is, a, it is an interesting initiative. So uh, in terms of local trends, just to reiterate, fentanyl is huge, both in form, uh, both in form of patches and powders and uh, fentanyl analogs, um, sometimes used deliberately, sometimes laced into a whole bunch of other drugs. Um, and bombs are becoming a very common thing, uh, so uh, keep a watch out for those. And if you see little blotters, um, you know, probably be suspicious of them. Cathinones are considerably more prominent than I had initially imagined. They're everywhere. People are taking MDMA probably are actually taking cathinones, so keep that in mind. Um, BHO, that's the dabbing, and juju joints are, again, becoming much more common. We'll get to see what the health effects of those are in the next few years, but I'm suspecting that we're going to find a whole bunch of nasty stuff with the, the use of dabbing. 
dips, the dip cigarettes. Again, it makes it quite hidden, uh, the, the, and not really obvious, the, the drug use, but it's very prominent. And again, a lot of cathinones in those and a lot of other various synthetic drugs that are mixed in. The other thing that uh, the police officer I was talking to wanted me to mention is phenacetin. Um, so you might remember a few years ago, uh, cocaine was being cut largely with levamisole, which was this horrible thing that gave you vasculitis and pretty much made your skin melt off. Um, levamisole has disappeared, so that's good. Um, it's been replaced by phenacetin. Phenacetin is dirt cheap. It's about 1 50th of the cost of cocaine. Uh, those who have been practicing for a little while might actually remember that it used to be used as an analgesic and actually used to be used in like Vicks tabs and stuff like that. Um, it was pulled from the market because it's nephrotoxic and potentially carcinogenic. Um, so we might start to see cocaine users that come in with renal failure, which could be ischemic from, from the cocaine use or it could be because of the adulterant phenacetin that's actually being used in there. So I want to say a really big thank you to my supervisor, Dr. Lisa Thurger, who's super helpful. Thank you to, to Carrie, who helped direct me to some of these resources. A very, very big thank you to Sergeant Jeff Pilon from the Ottawa Police Drug Service, who helped tell me like what was actually in the region, what was, what was being used, and, and kind of to what extent-ish. Um, thanks to Gori, who looked over my slides and gave me some very useful feedback. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Matthew Young, who works for the, um, the CCSA as well as the CCENDU. The CCENDU is an epidemiology network that's basically trying to see what is out there, trying to keep abreast of the trends in, uh, in Canada and in the region. They are doing a really fantastic job. So they're the ones that sent out a, the, a lot of the advisories on N-bombs, on fentanyl, well before the media got a hold of this. Um, so if you want good information on what is out there, this is probably the best resource that we have for, for our region.